So to run the pipeline, go down here to Amplicon 16S, 18S. And here, let us set up the pipeline. So first of all, you can use different types of databases. Why is this important? Uh, Silva is a good database to use. In a lot of cases, when people use environmental samples from soil and uh, water, you might want to refer to the green genes database that might have better annotation for those types of sequences. But for the local ones, that means that it's a database that is uploaded on the server and we can select the Silva database. The second thing is we have pair end or single end, and the only option for data to is parent. It's built for pair end reads. And here we have to select fast queue. Then we click on file upload. And here we need to use the URL bulk upload option to use the SVLs. Okay, so you can decide which one you want to use, the uh, small one which is just fecal or the big one, which is both fecal and sepal. Okay, that one has twice as many samples. And then you have to upload the supplementary text file. So this is going to be used for annotation. So you have to remember what are the names in your table. So here the name is library name. Okay, so you guys just gotta remember how you exactly spell that. And submit. And now I'll build the pipeline and I'll explain what each step does. So we start, we can skip pre-processing. In this case, we will do quality control based on QC filtering. So what this does is looks for specific links of the forward and the backward read files and allows for certain errors within those. If your settings are incorrect, for example, if the length of your read is 150 and you put 250, the whole pipeline will then fail. Okay, so then why are we looking for replication count? Okay, replication count means that we are looking for PCR amplified continuous repeats of the same sequence are going to be eliminated. They don't provide any new information because remember, this is not a quantitative technique. It's a technique to look at diversity and not to quantify how much of each type of uh, taxonomic classification we have. Okay, then we merge the pairs. So here we again have some settings. The pairs of reads have to be merged so that they um, are considered to be coming from the same biological sequence. So if there's too much of a spread between them, uh, you want to eliminate them. Then from these reads, we build consensus clusters or OTUs, operational taxonomic units. The goal of this procedure is to eliminate technical uh, issues that come from the different types of issues like PCR amplification, bad quality parent reads, and in this case, chimeric reads. Chimeric reads are reads that look like a single read, but they actually come from two different biological uh, pieces of DNA. And so here, those are selected and eliminated from our data. And finally, the taxonomy is assigned for each OTU. Now, once you have those taxonomic classes assigned to OTUs, you can ask the question, how are these related? So if they are closely related or farther apart, it makes sense to analyze samples that have a diversity of microorganisms that have very different uh, evolutionary backgrounds as something different as when we have something that are only closely related types of microorganisms. So that's why this part is being done. And here we can select two different tree methods, 
we can just keep it at nearest joint name, so NJ. Now the phyloseq uh, is where we visualize the results, just like we did last time manually. This is going to be done in an automated way. And then we'll take a look at how to do this in R. So here we can choose taxonomic level. Why don't we choose the lowest level with greatest definition of what we might expect to find in our biological sample? So why not go for family or species? One consideration could be that, you know, we'll find just too much diversity to interpret. The reason is actually because in some cases, we don't have a good annotation. So the lower we go in the taxonomic classification, the less is known. Like for example, if we see a microorganism and it has a 16S ribosomal RNA, we know it's a bacteria. It's not anything else. So kingdom, we know to recognize very well. But the lower we go in the taxonomic classification, the less we're able to identify. These databases are just not rich enough because the diversity of microorganisms, as we already saw in our last session, is so huge. So typically people go genus, order, or above. Okay, so phylum is a good way to summarize the data. Class, we can get greater definition, but it becomes confusing. It starts getting a lot of information. Order, right, more specific, etc. So let's keep it at class. Now here is the next uh, parameter, mean abundance. There are going to be some OTUs that have a lot of uh, members present. And so, for example, if we have the phylum selected, we know that hundreds is a good definition. We can change this and maybe put it at 50 to see what happens because we selected class. Now, color, remember, we have this additional column called library name. And later on, we can look at how we can include other factors. So, but this is how we can assign colors and shapes to individual samples based on, in this case, library name. And then ordination method. So just like we use principal component analysis to study variation between samples using continuous data, this data, because it's organized by operational taxonomic units, is going to be sparse. So it's going to have a lot of gaps. And because it has a lot of gaps, non-metric non space is better for this kind of an analysis. So you can choose, typically use, people use non-metric non dimensionality reduction techniques like NMDS or PCOA. Okay, and then you can click on save and click on end. Okay, it will probably take anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes, but not a long time. So let's go to download pipeline output files in the pipeline that I gave. Right, so uh, please open this pipeline together with me so you can take a look at the results. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look at this abundance table. Okay, this abundance table tells us how much of each OTU was found in each one of our samples. Remember the first three are, I think, uh, chow. The second three are high fat diet, okay? So with this information, we can't do a lot, but we can do something like, you know, NMDS or PCOA. Now, what do I mean by sparse data? First of all, that means that we have a lot of zeros, right? So there's a lot of OTUs that have zero in one category and some number in another category. But also look at the numbers, they're not continuous. We go from 55 to 211 to 117, right? So these are not continuous numbers, okay? What's the second one? The second one tells us the error plots for how the reads were selected. And there are two criteria for how the reads were selected. First of all, expected substitutions. And also there is going to be a quality profile for the forward and the back reads. So you can see that the quality of the forward uh, direction reads is greater 
than the ones for the other direction, right? So you can see the score of quality here on the Y and here's the position of each read. So you can see that it, especially here, you can see that it falls right here, right? Right about 270, which is what we specified. Now, the other thing is that you can notice here how many total reads we have. We have over 100,000 reads in each one. How many OTUs? 300, right? So from 100,000, this was grouped into operational taxonomic units and only 300 are left. Now, this is going to be very useful because when we think of a phylogenetic analysis between hundreds of thousands of sequences, that's not useful. But between 300, this is somewhat meaningful, okay? And it's meaningful because now we can study diversity. So here we have the phylogenetic tree, uh, and we also have, let's now take a look at um, phyloseq plots. Okay, so for the phyloseq plots, we have some summary of what was actually, okay, what does it mean that we have a zero in the table? So imagine you're looking for um, a bacteria that does not exist in that particular sample, right? That means you will have zero in your table. Okay, so here we have the same data that we saw in the abundance, but instead of the OTUs, we have them organized classified by phyla. So the phyla that we have as the most dominant is bacterial DTs and firmicutes. And then we have these smaller proportions down here at the bottom. So the remember we use the threshold, 100 or 50, and we can see the top abundance. So here we have the top abundant OTUs. And here we have the rest, right? So here you can see abundance goes between 100, which was our threshold to 500. And here are the rest, 0 0.025 to 0 0.1. So now we can kind of think of, in terms of the most dominant uh, classes that we are looking at, how are they different between the two conditions that we have, chow and high fat diet? For example, we can see that OTU 7, 4, and 5 are only, and 15, are only present in high fat diet. As opposed to chow, right, we can see, for example, that 13, 12, and 14 are specific to chow. And in some cases, we see this interesting composition, OTU 16 has less in chow and more in high fat diet. Right? So this is based on OTU. Now, how can this data be summarized to tell us what is the overall difference between these samples? And here we have two metrics. First is the alpha diversity metric. So the alpha diversity metric tells us about composition within each sample. And this number right here, the Y, represents approximately, you can kind of say this is how many individual species do we have, right? So remember, if you can kind of think of OTUs as distinct individual uh, groups of microbes, you can say that this is a number of how many um, of different kinds are present in each sample. It's a little bit more complicated than that. We have two different metrics to measure this. But you can see that this particular uh, metric tells us that, right? So here we have a group. These are fairly consistent. These are the chow samples, and these are the BKF, uh, sorry, these are the high fat diet. And there's quite a lot of variation in those. Uh, but we have two contradicting kind of results here. One says that it's lower diversity. Another one says that it's higher diversity, right? And so the conclusion from this is we probably should include a little bit more samples, which is why we gave you the second table to try and run that analysis again. How can we plot these graphs in which software? So right after I'm done with explaining what this means, we will go to R and you will plot all of these in R that um, once you've got the data processed, you can use PhiloSeq in R to plot these um, there. 
Okay. And the second measure is beta diversity, right? And so beta diversity tells us what's the difference between samples. So here you have two groups of samples and you have a good separation between them in this non-metric space. And so this diversity shows us that indeed there's a good separation between the chow and high fat diet. It is less related to by which because this actually tells us by which, right? And so here you have these weights come in because the difference, the fact that OTU7 is high abundance, which means it's important, and in the phylogenetic tree, it's so distant from the rest, it means it's something unique that we should probably give more weight to. As opposed to, for example, we have these three guys right here, and there's some difference in abundance between them as well. And then these two, right? But they're fairly close together, evolutionary speaking. And so that maybe has less of a significance for us in terms of how we look at this information. 